Well, welcome to Act Like Men, where we are godly men pursuing purpose, being fully present while leading and loving the people God has entrusted to us. And we're taking two verses that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 16, unpacking them and discovering and becoming the men God created us to be. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith. Say that, stand firm in the faith. Act like men, be strong. And let all that you do be done in love. You've made it to session three, firm in the faith. Say that right now. Say firm in the faith. Paul said, be watchful and stand firm in the faith. Another way to say that is to let your convictions lead you, not culture or your emotions. Let your convictions lead you, not culture or your emotions. The word conviction, it comes from the Latin root to convince. And it's this idea that I'm going to convince someone to believe firmly in the truth of something. And I can't convince you if I don't believe firmly in the truth to persuade someone to do something. Like this is so resolute in me. In fact, another translation says, be resolute. It's so resolute in me that it will not waver. And convince finds its roots in the word conquer to overcome or defeat in an argument. Now, I don't want you to be argumentative, but rather I want you to get in the fight of this culture right now. I want you to get in the fight for our kids, for our families, for this nation, for our church. Now, I'm not trying to ask you to take up arms, but I'm saying there's a way to wage war against the enemy, and it starts by standing firm in our faith because we can't fight the battles ahead if we're not founded on biblical conviction. Make no mistake, we are in a battle today. Ephesians 6, this is Paul again. He says, this is no afternoon athletic contest that we walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is a four keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. We're in a fight. And I was a youth pastor for many years, and many years ago, my wife and I took our seniors on a senior trip, and we went to Rio Doso, New Mexico, which is a pretty cool little area. And one of the nights, we'd kind of gotten bored, and some of the guys decided, let's start a water fight. And I thought this was hysterical. I had no clue where this water fight was going to lead, but as you know, it begins to build on top of it. And then the next thing I know, we have a whole team of people surrounding my wife and her team with just gallons of water ready to douse. And I said, you better surrender. And she said, no, you better not throw that water. And I said, you better surrender. And this war went went back and forth, and then it was it. Somebody just flinched, and then we doused them in gallons of water. And I thought, well, we won. It's going to end here. Well, I was wrong. My wife left. She took some people with her, and then I went to bed. I came, she came back home, and unbeknownst to me, she had found a cop in the area. And this cop had given her and the other students some pepper spray. And my wife came and doused my pillow and my room with pepper spray to the fact that I found myself outside throwing up for nearly an hour. Why? Because I had this foundational truth that Megan would have mercy and fight fair. But that sucker used some weapons of mass destruction. She did not fight fair, and I lost all because I had the wrong foundation. There's two things we learned from this. Number one, don't jack with Megan. (laughs) Number two, your foundations matter. So what is your faith founded upon? When when all is stripped away, when, when you face overwhelming odds, what's the bedrock of your faith? What does your faith land solidly on? I want to tell you there are two things that are competing with your convictions right now. There are two things that are competing with your convictions. There are two things competing at war with your convictions, with your faith, your soul, and our culture. Your soul is your internal driving 
force. We're made up of three parts. Every human is made of three parts. We are body, spirit, and soul. The body houses everything. And we see this physically. I feel like I don't need to tell you this part. The spirit is what connects with and aligns with the heart of God. But our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. So our soul is what I think, it's what I want, and it's what I feel. And these three things drive everything in my life. But you need to know that your soul is constantly at war with your spirit. Your spirit is what is connected to the heart of the living God, and the soul is the part of you that wants what you want. Paul said it like this in Romans 7. He said, I don't really understand myself. For what I want to do, what is right, I do not do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Paul goes on with this tirade over and over. He goes, I want to do what's right, but I do what's wrong. And when I, I want to do what's wrong, I feel horrible inside. And I think many of you can probably relate to this. That's the war between my soul and my spirit. Your thoughts, desires, and feelings are not godly on their own because you and I, we are sinners. There is a battle. In fact, James said it like this, temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. In order to stand firm, I have to recognize that my spirit and soul are at war. And we're at war with our own desires. So what should our response be? Denying myself and daily surrendering. Now this is difficult, but it is possible. And you need two things. You need the power of the Holy Spirit and you need a community of believers. That's why we do connect groups at the Movement Church. If you're here, I hope that you're watching this with your connect group. And not just that you're in a group of friends, but you are authentically engaged with your faith community. We'll talk about this in our next session. There are two things that are competing with your convictions, your soul and our culture. Your soul is your internal driving force, but culture is our external driving force. So we live in a fallen and broken world just like Corinth, who Paul was writing to when he said, act like men. The culture that we live in today says, do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, wherever you want, just don't hurt anyone. It's a counter-Christian culture. The culture today would say biblical sexual ethic where the Bible says that sex is designed only within the context of a marriage between one man and one woman, our culture would say, no thanks, that's old school, that's archaic, I'll sleep with whoever I want, whenever I want, and without any consequences. The Bible would say that we are driven and lead and live by faith and convictions, that they set the standard, not my feelings. But our culture would say, no, you live your truth. You decide what truth is. And if you decide what truth is, then if you change your mind, if you have a bad day or something really crappy happens, guess what happens? Your truth will shift and you'll find yourself wandering aimlessly. Make no mistake about it. We're in a battle and we need godly men who will stand firm in the faith. And you need a solid foundation if you're going to stand firm in your faith. Let me say that again. You need a solid foundation if you're going to stand firm in faith. So today, I want to share a biblical foundation or biblical foundations that do not change. These don't waver. It doesn't adjust as the years pass and we learn more things. These are biblical truths. This is called historical Christian orthodoxy. Now, you don't have to agree and you don't have to believe, but this is the foundation of the Christian faith and anything else is counter-Christian. So you don't have to agree, you don't have to believe,
But I'm just telling you, this is Christian faith. And the reason I want to share these with you is because as you're in a battle, as you're in war, and mentally, emotionally, physically, culturally, as you're fighting the enemy and everything he's trying to do to stop and thwart what God wants to do in your life, you can come back to these as a North Star. When you're overwhelmed, when you're discouraged, when you don't have the answers, you can come back to these as a North Star. So let's talk about five biblical foundations to stand on. Number one, you are created by God and the object of his holy love. You are created by God and the object of his holy love. Genesis 1, 27 said, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. And this answers questions that plague people like, who am I? Like, what is my identity? Well, if you are created, then you have already been given an identity. You don't have to discover it. It is yours by divine nature. You are created. It answers the questions of feeling shame. No, you're the object of God's holy love. You, God loves you so much that he gave his only son that if you just believe in him, you'll live forever. It answers the questions of redemption, that God loves me. It answers the questions of God's sovereignty. He is good. He is just. He is holy. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and he created me. Number two, you've been created for a unique purpose. One of my favorite scriptures in the word is Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. And that word matters. Why? When you think about the word masterpiece, you think about an artist who painstakingly pours his heart and soul and everything that he or she is into this work of art. And this work of art is not just some thing. It is a piece of him and it has a purpose. It serves a purpose and it impacts our world and it adds beauty to our world. And when the scripture says that you are God's masterpiece, he's painstakingly created you, that you are a beautiful work of his art, of, of his hand, and, and you were created to impact our world in a beautiful way. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things that he planned for us long ago. So before you were born, before he created you, he had, a, he had you in mind and he had a plan for you. Number three, the problem in our world is not other people. The problem in our world is not hate. The problem in our world is not a pandemic. The problem in our world is not racism. The problem in our world is not disease that kills. The problem in our world is not famine and pestilence. The problem in our world is not war. The problem in our world is sin. Romans 5 said, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone has sinned. Sin is the problem. You need to know that. So that's the battle that we fight. We don't fight people. We fight the enemy. The scripture says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers in dark places. Why? Because sin is the problem. And the father of sin is Satan. You need to know that. So you were created by God and the object of his holy love. You're created with a unique purpose, which answers the question of why am I here? Is life meaningless? Is there direction for my life? And the problem in our world is sin and only sin. It answers the questions of why do bad things happen to good people? Because our world has fallen, because Adam and Eve had the ability to choose not to sin, but they chose to do what their soul wanted more than what God wanted. And sin entered and now bad things happen. God created a perfect world, but Adam and Eve changed the nature. And you know what? You and I can understand that because we still choose to do what we want to do rather than what God wants to do. So we don't get mad at Adam and Eve. We just become grateful for what God is doing. And that's the next point. If there is a problem, then there has to be a solution. What is a solution? Well, Jesus is the only solution for humanity. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This answers the questions of can I earn salvation by doing good things? No. Can I lose salvation if I make a mistake again? Absolutely not. His grace is sufficient. 
This answers the question of, I know where I'm going. This answers the question that says, God's giving purpose to my pain because he's redeeming things. But not only that, it means that this life is not about this life. This life is temporary. This life is short. The Bible says it is but a vapor. We're here today and gone tomorrow. There will come a day where you and I will pass away and then we'll live for eternity in one of two places, heaven or hell. And the deciding factor is whether or not we chose to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. So if I know I am bound for glory, that I'm bound for heaven, that I'll spend eternity, my life in the throne room of God, praising and worshiping God, where there are no tears, there is no sorrow, there is no sadness, there is only joy and peace that passes all understanding and life to the fullest. If I know that, then anything that I face here, I can face with hope. Hope for a future. Hope that there's a brighter future ahead, a better day. Why? Because Jesus is the solution. He's paid the penalty of my sins and he's given me an eternity with him. These are foundational truths. You have to hold on to them. You need them in your life because you will face pain. Jesus said that. He said, you're gonna have trials and tribulations, but take heart because I've overcome the world. Why would he say that? Because it's not going to last forever. Another scripture says that though sorrow may last for the night, joy comes in the morning. You need these foundational truths. And lastly, we live our life wholly and sacrificially unto God. <clears throat> God created me and I'm the object of his holy love. He's created me with a unique purpose. The problem is sin, but Jesus is my solution. So what do I do with my life between the day that I was born and the day that I die? What do I do with my life during that span of time? Whether it's 40 years, 60 years, 100 years, Romans 12.1 gives us the answer. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Look at this. This is your true and proper worship. So how I live is a reflection of whose I am. To live selflessly, sacrificially, is the greatest expression of worship, and it's part of my unique purpose. And our world desperately needs some guys who get this, who stand firm in the faith, that they're keeping watch, that they're committed to pursuing purpose, being fully present while leading and loving the people entrusted to us. Our world desperately needs you to act like men.